The Guitar Shop Podcast. We are back. We're back. We're back. And uh, we are coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, here at Wade's Guitar Shop. I am Wade Stark, owner of Wade's Guitar Shop. I am Alex Ballard, managerial responsibilities for Wade's Guitar Shop. Yes. Uh, Dan could not be here tonight. We really were expecting him at the last minute. Uh, we were unable to contact him and he didn't show up. So we are going to shoot without Dan tonight. And, uh, Probably make fun of him a little while he's <laughs> not here. Yeah. Yes, and I'm sure that he is probably in the car making fun of us too, like he, as we speak. Well, yeah. us, but yeah. that I mean. Uh, please check us out. Uh, the Guitar Shop Podcast can be found in the iTunes Store, Zoom Marketplace, Miro, and uh, at Wade'sGuitarShop.com. Click on the podcast link, and it will take you to previous episodes and uh, notes about each podcast. Uh, if you have questions, comments, please send them to us at uh, email address Wade's Guitar Shop at sbcglobal.net. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again for Dan. All right. Dot net. Dot net. Pretty good. <laughs> Uh, we, first of all, uh, really intended to get the podcast rolling uh, several, several, several weeks prior to this, but uh, for those of you who know the shop, you probably know that on both July 15th and July 22nd, our neighborhood got flooded big time, particularly July 22nd. Uh, we'll throw up a, a bit of the footage from some guys who shot the flood from outside the store here using uh, cell phones and whatnot. Uh, Check it out at uh, Shorewood Rapids. Shorewood Rapids. Shorewood Rapids on YouTube. YouTube. Yes. Uh, but it was crazy, crazy, and kind of scary. But uh, we think things are clean and back to shape, and we're going to get the podcast steady and rolling here again. So thanks for coming back. And for those of you who are checking out for the, for the first time, welcome. <clears throat> uh, the first story I'm going to jump into is picking Alex's brain about uh, one of these perplexing things that even e even as many times as I have already attempted it at home, every time I still come back to you and have to ask you because you are <clears throat> my guru and to a lot of our customers you are too, miking guitar amps. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I guess for a lot of people it's hard. I mean, especially as a guitarist, I think it's really hard when you try to record what's coming out of a cab when you're standing in front of a cabinet or when you're playing club gigs or right. you know rehearsing with your band or whatever and you have be it a small combo or a half stack or whatever it is you mm -hmm. know and you just you hear the sound bouncing around the room and if you're standing in front of your cabinet you feel the wind blowing I mean you know and then suddenly you know they're taking this little tiny mic and playing it back to these little tiny speakers you know so there's always a you know sort of a disconnect between what you really sound like and, how, and what what ends up on on uh, the final uh, recording. Well, I mean, first of all, w we get all the time customers coming in and saying that they don't even feel the need anymore for using an app for recording. They're all doing their stuff, you know, digitally at home. Uh, they're they're running directly into a USB device, and then they're using amp emulators. And I I still have yet to hear. You know, and my ears pretty well trained, and yours for recording is even better than mine. I have yet to hear somebody taking a guitar, throwing it directly into a computer, running it through uh, VST plugins, amp emulators, and sounding as good as miking a real, you know, yeah, vintage I agree. guitar amp. I agree, and I think 
those things are great for subsidizing something that's missing mm -hmm. or, or doing the fixing in the mix right. kind of things, you know, using amp plugins to reamp things or, or, you know, if you just, you know, I guess there's no replacing getting the, the right sound at the source. And if you didn't do that, right. you know, if you, if you really listen to the track and go, geez, I should have used Les Paul and the Twin on this one or whatever right. it is, um, you can maybe take the existing track that you have and manipulate it using those plugins. And that is awesome. I think that's great. But using them, and, you know, it's great to use them uh, when you live in an apartment and it's the middle of the night or if you have kids in mm -hmm. the house or whatever. But yeah, I mean, to try to make them sound like the real deal is, is really difficult. But it, I guess it's really difficult to, you know, for a lot of people to record a real amp sound. But, but I think, you know, once you, uh, once you get the ball rolling, you can really get great results. Well, your favorite yeah. setup yeah. is not a super complicated one. I mean, we'll, we'll shoot these pictures up right here. These are pictures we took today of just setting up the mics <coughs> in the position that you would normally use. For your your favorite setup of in this case we were recording you know or setting up as if we were going to record uh, an all tube Fender twin amp uh, an 80s tube combo not a classic twin reverb but the idea being you know a high powered uh, 212 all tube reverb combo and you were doing a two mic setup so kind of explain explain this setup. Well, um, I guess you know if you read about this kind of thing, um, a lot of sort of the great amp tones that we've heard over the years, um, you know, most of the engineers tend to, to mainly use dynamic mics, um, some ribbon mics, close up to the speaker. But So a dyna uh, explain a dynamic mic quick to um, anybody who doesn't understand dynamic mics. Dynamic mic is what you, what you use mostly live. I mean, people use condenser mics too, but, but a dynamic mic is a dynamic moving coil, essentially. It's uh, a magnet, uh, a north and south magnet with a little... I don't know, some kind of transducer widget in there. Right. But, uh, you know, it just senses the difference between the, the vibrations or whatever. And basically, so, no, uh, no phantom power, no batteries, right, no, right. no built in circuitry. It's yeah. And, and a lot of, there are dynamic mics that have very broad, flat frequency responses, but typically, dynamic mics tend to have tailored frequency. They're, they're mission specific. Um, you know, so like an SM58 is the most popular handheld mic in the world. Right. And it's not flat, and it doesn't record everything, but it works great at what it does, which is to record what's, or it's mainly well, for used live for live, but, right, yeah. you know, it's just to pick up what's right in front of it and not what's all around that, you know, so right. it's that kind of microphone. But for whatever reason, well, I guess ultimately, dynamic mics, um, you know, the, the benefits of a, of a condenser mic are lost mostly on guitar cabs because you, you don't have the real fast transients and you don't have the real high highs, you know. Um, I guess I'm not 100% positive why a dynamic, you know, a dynamic mic is very similar to a speaker. Right. You know, they're, they're very similar in nature and I think maybe that's part of it is that they actually kind of work on the same principle, so they play nice together. Well, I, th I think in, yeah. in the iPhone, the, the little speaker in the back of the new iPhones and iPod Touches uh, also is used as a speaker. Right, so you, so, you can, right. right, you can, a speaker and a dynamic mic work on almost identical Did principles. Did I say that right? The speaker in the back is also used as a as microphone. As a mic, right, right. right. Yeah. So I think that might be part of it. You know, they really <clears throat> kind of talk to each other nice, to use layman's terms. Well, a condenser um, mic then yeah. is something that's much more sensitive but requires uh, power via uh, phantom, you know, power phantom, phantom power yeah. or, or built-in circuit or that, battery, that requires some right, sort of battery. Or, yeah. um, and, and typically, a, 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 most condenser, condenser mics are made to be pretty flat. In other words, they're, they're not supposed to hype things up. Right. And they tend to not be mission specific. They tend to be, you know, this thing you can do anything with it, you know. But guitar is one of those things that, that um, that's why I, I like a two mic setup. Um, you know, the dynamic mic captures the meat and potatoes of the sound. Mm -hmm. But if you're standing in the room with the guitar playing it through an amp, you're hearing th this stuff bouncing everywhere. And it's nice at least to, to have the option at mix down or whatever mm -hmm. to, to integrate some of that room sound. It sounds more natural to me as a guitar player. Right. And, um, you know, at the point in which you start to mix stuff, like when people would record my guitar, I'd be like, wow, that sounds awful. Oh, in the mix, it'll be fine, you know. Right. But, you know, they should almost say, well, 
Well, it's still gonna sound awful, and I'm gonna roll all the bass off and really hype up the high frequency and compress the hell out of it. You know, <laughs> you'll hate it. You know, but I mean, so there is a certain amount of that. I mean, sometimes what is your ideal guitar sound ends up being impossible to mix into into the context of the right. music you're doing. But, but I mean, I guess that's the most important thing is you know, pick the sound that you want from the get go that makes sense for the song, and then capture that as accurately as possible. And and you know, the, the easiest way to get the meat and potatoes of the sound, I think, is with a dynamic mic. And then um, I brought a, a multi-pattern uh, condenser microphone. It's a tube mic, too. Right. So it has a nice warm tone. Um, well, your dynamic yeah. mic is the one that's that's right up against the amp. Yep. Because it's, it, it wants to get hit with something closer and, and harder because it's, it's a little harder to push the element on a condenser mic. Right. You got, I mean, I mean uh, on a dynamic mic. Right. Dynamic mics, you generally want to be right up on them. You right. know, they don't have a huge sound field. So in your rig, your dynamic is is right up by the amp, and, and kind of explain how you locate it on the speaker then. And, and like. Well, I actually just happen to have a speaker here. <laughs> no. Um, but, but the way uh, a speaker, um, a guitar speaker works, um, high frequencies are, are uh, almost get narrowed, you know as they uh, project. So the very center uh, where, is where the voice coil is. This is where most of the brightness is. And, and the farther you get away from the center of the speaker, um, the less it, it is projecting that high end. So if you, uh, oh, oh, my back, <laughs> no, I'll sue. Um, so if you, put the, if you put the mic right here, you'll get a super bright sound with not too much bass. And the farther you move it to the edge of the speaker, the darker the sound gets and the more bass you get. So if you're looking for a real beefy, low endy sound, you can kind of get it over here. If you're trying to bring out more treble and high frequency, you can go somewhere between here and here. And uh, for so best... So off to the side is referred to as off, off, off axis, axis. Is this is called. So when you hear off yeah. axis, that, that is what is being referred to. It's yep. off the axis of the center of the speaker. Yep. And sometimes people refer to it as I centered it or I center mic'd it, and that would mean that it's at the center of the, of the voice coil or center of the speaker, which is going to be the most trebly. So depending on what kind of guitar sound you're going for, that's really what dictates where you put this one in relationship to the center of the speaker to the outer edge. doesn't matter so much if you tilt it this way or this way per se, although like let's say I wanted to really reject a lot of the, the high frequency, I could actually kind of put it like this. That would be rejecting, the probably giving the darkest tone. Um, but you know, generally speaking, we go straight uh, on, I guess, on axis in terms of the position of the microphone. But um, you know, you can really just do this by ear, you know, and just kind of find that sweet spot on the speaker. And actually, if you move the mic all the way around a speaker like this, you'll find different um, sounds as you kind of go around, almost like a drum head. There's different spots that sound good. Um, and I guess generally speaking, in, you know, the twin has two speakers, we just use one mic. For the most part, people tend to only use one mic even in multiple speaker setups uh, in terms of the close mic. Um, just because, you know, particularly if you have matched speakers, you're, you're, you're probably just going to get more cancellation than you are going to mm -hmm. be adding anything to it. But, you know, sometimes people want a mic every, every speaker. Right. Or if you have, some people have cabinets with multiple different speakers in them. You know, so in which case there's right. some validity to, to miking both a Jensen and a Celestian or something like that. But anytime you use two mics, you're opening up Pandora's box in terms of phase. Phase issues, yeah, right. Phase issues, so, and and yeah. phase issues are going to be, you know, where the the actual sine wave of the signal, if they're if they're possibly just sort of opposite, where where one is on the rise and one is in the trough at the same point in, in the music, they will cancel each other out. You know, so well, right, and, and uh, I guess the other, the other way to put it would be if they're not exactly aligned, there will be phase cancellation right. to varying degrees. So, so even if this one's, you know, even if the, this mic is, is picking up the peak of the signal a little bit faster than, than this mic is, as they drop out, you know, they're going to be right. eating each other essentially a little bit. But, um, you know, I, just to use a phrase I've used many times, you know, phase is a, a friend or an enemy to be feared, you know. <laughs> but you really, ultimately, particularly in this sort of scenario where you're using a two mic setup with guitar, you, you really are going to use the phase to your, well, hopefully you're going to use phase to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Because basically, if you think about it, we're going to have one mic that's, that's close to the, the speaker, 
and then we're going to have this other mic, which is going to pick up everything equally. It's going to be an omni. But you could just use a cardioid, too. It could be a mm -hmm. cardioid condenser, which is just going to pick up stuff that's more or less in front of it. Um, <clears throat> but either way, if in our scenario, we're about six or eight feet back. I don't know. We're not maybe right. at ten feet. But, but when, you, when you take two mics and one's right there at the source and one's ten feet back, right. There's a phase issue because they're both getting yeah. the same information but at different times. And at certain frequencies. And at certain frequencies, right. Because right. Some, some waves will, will be completely in sync and other ones will be out of, exactly. out of phase. So some signals might b bounce out more and or boost almost and some right. will disappear completely. You know? Well, because it's omni, yeah. it's picking up in a, in a spherical sort of pattern, so mm -hmm. you're, you're picking up reflections with that mic too then. So, Absolutely. And, and you want Absolutely. room reflections. That's, well, that's because that, your... right, that's what I think for me as a guitar player, when I hear a, a close mic sound of my guitar, it's so different from what I'm accustomed right. to when I'm standing in a room with it. Because what I'm, I'm hearing, you know, you got your amp at your ankles half the time. Yep. I mean, unless you have it pointed straight at your head, you know, yeah. you really are, are picking up a little bit of what's coming out of there and just everything that's being reflected at you. So I, I really like to do that sort yeah. of thing. But you, right, you have to find that sweet spot. And, and uh, there's lots of sources that you, can, you could use. Um, you know the physics of sound, like you were saying, like uh, ten feet is is ten milliseconds. Right. Well, well sound sound travels at yeah. a thousand feet per second. So every foot that that any a speaker is away from you or amps are apart, every foot for sound is one millisecond. So, right. So I mean, if, so if, you're, example, if you're if you're a hundred yeah. feet away from a PA column at a, at a concert, that's a hundred milliseconds. That's a tenth of a second that it's taking for the sound to get to you. So. Right. Right. So for example, if you ha if we have a, a mic ten feet from uh, another mic that's right on the right. on there, we could we could take those two signals and in in whatever editing software we could take them and go oh well this one's here and this one's here let's smush those together. Yeah. But ultimately that's not really what we want because what we really want is we want to give give ourselves the impression that we're in <clears> the room with it. So we do want that ten milliseconds right. and that's enough time for our mind to say. The sound is is not emanating from a little tiny spot on a speaker. Right. You know, it's I'm hearing a guitar in a room, so you have to kind of. I mean, at least in in this scenario, that's um, some. And in the end, you might just use the close mic, or you might just use the room mic. You right. know, but you have both those options, and that's um, you know. So anyway, I think the best way to do that is to just if you have a friend, you can kind of have you wear headphones, they wear headphones, and the person plays, and you can kind of find the sweet the close mic sweet spot right and then do the same thing with the room mic you know have somebody play the guitar and move it back move it to the left move it to the right if you're using a cardioid mic the directional aspects are going to be more key because it's a directional mic so you may want to have it down low straight on axis with the with the speaker or you may want to have it pointed at the back wall um, you know again it would be great if you can kind of experiment with right, that right. you know so well, at the, yeah. end of, at the end of the day, if, if you have a setup similar to, to the one that you're showing, though, you at least have the deck stacked in your favor, as opposed to somebody walking into it and not even knowing where to stick the mics, and they're either going to go, I'm going to put one mic right in front of the speaker a foot away, and then I'm going to put another microphone up in the corner of the room, or maybe not even use another microphone, or right. maybe not use any microphones at all and say, you know what, it all seems too tricky, I'm just going to plug directly into my amp. Right, right. And, and then just well, use and, amp emulators. And that's, and that's great. I mean, that's definitely a great way to use those amp, amp impul, impul, emulators. <laughs> impulators. <laughs> Aggregators. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I, th I think it's, it isn't rocket science. Um, I mean, you know, you can treat it like that, though, too. I mean, there's lots of, of audio. Um, I guess anytime you're going to start moving mics pretty close to each other, you're right. kind of asking for trouble. Yeah. In our scenario, our mics are far enough apart that the phase issue, it, it's, it, it's not as much of a phase issue as it is a perception of a room. You know, if we right. were to take that same condenser mic and put it just a few feet or a foot back from the speaker, we would have massive fa uh, phase cancellation, almost guaranteed. Right. Yeah. So. The, the, and the whole phase issue too. You know, uh, we'll we'll try and post some stuff in the, the show notes. The phase issue is for the human ear too. So when you are in a, a live situation or you are recording, your your ears hear things that are out of phase too, which is why like acoustic amplifiers these days or acoustic guitar pickups have a phase inverter because sometimes you'll be playing your guitar and you're playing with with a PA or other musicians and your your amp is cranked up and you're just not hearing your guitar at all. And you might be completely out of phase with the with the 
the PA system. Yeah, and, you're, and you and you 180 that, and boom. Right, you're, you're fighting you're an uphill battle, and right, yeah. you need you need to get everything you know into a reasonable phase relationship so that everything is projecting at a similar similar. Let volume. me ask you this. Uh, I know we probably want to move on, but um, in our scenario, uh, we have we're talking about phase, but can you kind of explain polarity to me um, in terms of? Well, yeah. I, that, that's funny that you would ask me that because yeah. you, you brought up polarity earlier today yeah. when I asked you about phase relationship. And I, I think of polarity uh, the, the way kind of you were describing it to me as, as phase two, that I, I just kind of considered phase and polarity the same thing, but I, right. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I kind of look at it like, you know, there's electronic. You should probably, if you're to get into this, you should probably study both um, phase in, in regards to recording and polarity in, in regards to electronics because ultimately like when, when we refer to a on a mixer you, there's a phase reverse button right. but it's not really reversing phase it's reversing polarity it's electronically reversing polarity oh. so like if a speaker is a dynamic you know right. speaker is moving <clears throat> like this and one microphone's on it like this and it's moving like this right. you 180 that and then it's there you know or if you have two microphones, right. this one's behind the amp and this one's in front of the amp, you 180 the phase on this and now they're playing nice together. Right. But it's but that's not really the same thing as Well as no, yeah, 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 then then I can I think yeah. in understanding what you're talking about would be uh, any any type of driver that you're using, you know, at, at least with with speakers, the polarity, you know, would be referring to, you know, if you have two speakers in a cabinet and you accidentally hook the, the positive lead to the, the negative terminal on one speaker and then vice versa on the other one. They're going like one, this. One speaker is yeah. pushing while the other one's pulling and, right. and, and it would be... They cancel a lot of it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You, yeah. You'd barely even hear that. Yeah. So those are the two things you really kind of should look at when... And we will use too. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, when you start recording with, with more than one mic and more than one speaker. <laughs> and, and, and believe me, with, yeah. with, with the deals that, that there are right now on, on microphones, I mean... There are some really great condenser mics out there now for a lot cheaper than they ever were in the past. So for home recording, I mean, you can put up a, put together a setup kind of like the one that you had for, for cheap. Well, the, the one that I had was probably about a $250 setup. Right. Um, I, and I guess I would say this too. The, the mics that we tend to prefer for the dynamic mic portion of the equation are, for the most part, pretty cheap ones. You know, they have... Uh, you, you, you can kind of pick one that really kind of works with your speaker, but they're all kind of limited bandwidth, mid-range centric uh, devices that are mostly under a hundred bucks. There's some great ones that are super expensive too, but um, and the condenser mic, you know, could be be the, from the humble to the exotic, but you know, you could you could get a hundred dollar one or a thousand dollar one, and they're probably both work kind of all right. And used yeah. half to two thirds of that. Yep. Um, moving along. Uh, and I, and I first wanted to say that, if, if I've never explained this before on the podcast, I very seldom tell Alex or Dan what I'm actually going to talk about because it's the spontaneity of these conversations that I think make them very lively and really kind of uh, make it feel more spontaneous. So as we progress along here tonight and in future podcasts, uh, just know that I, I very seldom tell you guys what I'm going to talk about. And I ask you one time if you'd rather have a list of my topics or if you'd rather just sort of be hit with them. And Alex and Dan both said, surprise us. It's more fun. Yep. yep. So uh, I have hanging over here this Fallen Gretsch guitar. I'll let you get yeah. that. Lord, Lord. And the reason why... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the, re the reason why I hung this over here and why I, why I brought this out is a, a while back we did a, a story on talking about uh, vintage guitar bargains, you know, things that are still good investment, you know, still affordable. They're definitely going to be shooting up in value over time. And I wanted to, every once in a while on, on podcast, maybe even every, every episode, highlight a piece of equipment that is, you know, representative of guitars that are still a really great deal. And the reason why I picked this one this is uh, a Gretsch uh, all solid wood arch top from the 50s that is still under a thousand bucks. And this one is in fantastic condition. We've got it tagged at 999 with a really nice case. You might find these anywhere from, 
you know, 850 to maybe 1200 bucks, you know, kind of depending on what part of the country or world you're in. And of course, you know, if you're in Manhattan or London or Berlin, you know, they, they may be quite a bit more than that, but relative to where you are, still a really good bargain. This guitar is a fantastic handmade jazz guitar that is now almost 60 years old for under a thousand bucks. And for those of you who are out there looking at, you know, American standard Stratocasters and are looking at, you know, Japanese made low or mid priced Gretsch guitars that are a thousand bucks, you know, there are some really great guitars out there. And this one just recently came in on trade and, you know, sometimes my, my heart still goes pitter-patter to see a guitar like this that's, that is just so beautiful and still so affordable. I would love to have not played through your entire conversation, but it's so gorgeous <laughs> to, to you. Just the minute you pick this up, it just it just talks to you. You know, one of the things that I love about this guitar right off the bat is, you, it, and I don't know if you can close up this, but there's two just absolutely beautiful pieces of maple here. This maple, right? Yeah, that's fine and maple, then, right? Right, and then this thin center piece of probably what, ebony. walnut or ebony or something like that, right? Yeah. So this neck is just now this guitar is from the. 1949, well, 49, and this neck, yeah, this neck is just true as can be. I mean, I'm just looking at it going, this is straight as an arrow. Has a truss rod, yeah, you know, this a, lot, is a, lot of old, a lot guitar. of old cheap arch tops, yeah. you know, or you know, lower mid mid grade arch tops from a lot of companies don't have an adjustable truss rod. This one, perfect. Yeah, so I mean, it's a 60 year old guitar, and it's just, you know, it's a Ferrari. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you just, you know, just, it just feels so great, you know, and uh, you know, the original tuners, you know. I think these are original tuners, right? Those are original tuners, yeah. yeah. So it's just neat sometimes to see a, a guitar with, you know, 60-year-old tuners and in the back with this beautifully kind of somewhat book-matched or actually pretty well book-matched. Yeah, it's a flame center maple. Center back, flame maple. Yeah, back and sides, flame maple, solid spruce top. Solid spruce top. Yeah, look at that pick guard. I mean, and the pick guard, yeah. And that's probably original too, right? Yeah. And it's just, you don't get pick guards like this too. <laughs> no, the detail yeah. of that is, I don't know if you can see that, Real close, but it's yeah. Is is there nobody's so technology deco, you know, today that can yeah. make pickguards like that? Yeah, anymore? that's or suits like that. So I mean, I, I don't know if there's any. And it barks. Yeah. It, oh, it totally barks. I mean, it is. It's a great sounding guitar. So it's not just like it's kind of cool, but out of out of favor. You know, these guitars sound amazing. Yeah, they're, 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 Uh, I haven't found a really great resource to direct people to, you know, to find these kind of bargains, but it would be really nice if somehow uh, different stores or a website or something could kind of compile some sort of list of these really great bargains. I mean, you know, it'd be something that I would love to do, but considering everything that's on my plate these days, I don't have quite enough time to, to put together these lists, but I'm going to try and keep reminding everybody that there are great, 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 great vintage guitars out there for certainly under two grand and this is an example of one that's under a grand so seek them out don't always buy the 2010 whatever it looks like the flavor of the day you know look at old cool stuff because it will make you rethink the way you play and, and write a song yeah i'm working on my <laughs> yeah we just had a harmony um solid carved harmony guitar oh, that was just gorgeous late, late 30, and i yeah. think we sold it for 400 bucks i mean and I, I said to numerous people, I was just like, you know, you couldn't make this guitar today, and if you could, it would be, you know, four grand or yeah, something, you know. Yeah. So, you know, stuff like that is is kind of. I mean, obviously, like I said, the just the feel of it. If anybody who played that guitar is just going to have a great time. Yeah. With it. But, but um, yeah, there's goats in them. Right? So, yeah. Goats. Goats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it, you know, and I, I, what you just reminded me too was uh, with arch tops, that is why there are no American companies making cool, you know, affordable arch tops anymore because it is too expensive to make that yeah, kind of guitar. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. And that's why, that, that's why it's such a, that's why I was going to say it was just such a no-brainer in terms of, I, I mean, I don't collect them or anything, but, yeah. but certainly when you have these solid carved arch top instruments made in the 20s through 40s, 50s and stuff, yeah. and they're selling for four to six, eight hundred, a thousand bucks yeah. or something like that, I mean, come on. Really, exactly. you know, just wait, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway. Cool. Um, we have a uh, only one viewer mail to shoot at you tonight. We're going to try and uh, keep this within a reasonable time. But this is from uh, 
Aaron, who uh, says, hey guys, love the show. I listen to it at work because I can verify the data and listen at the same time. So first of all, I want to shout out to his boss how <laughs> awesome it is to let him listen to podcasts and then verify our data uh, online I while, while right. he's supposed to be right. working. So Aaron, you have right. got the next best job to Alex's. Uh, then he, he goes on to say a bunch of stuff about uh, you know our episode that we did on multi multi effects and uh, multi personality multi schizophrenics multi personalities no. yes uh, he also talks a little bit about home setups but I wanted to get into what what he says here uh, I want to eventually do all my own setups and this kind of leads into a, a sort of a theme for of, his of, home uh, yeah I'd say you know clean your air conditioning uh, <laughs> make sure you get shingles on the roof uh, tighten up the uh, no the main hatches. No, yeah, let, yeah. let the plumber do the work for $1,100. $1, Here are the two issues that prevent me from doing my own setup. One, not enough gear. You need two, some... no posable thumbs. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but a prehensile tail. Yeah, okay. sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the tail does come in handy. <laughs> Hand me that screwdriver. All right. Yeah. Can we uh, edit in a tail handing me a screwdriver? Come on. We, we don't need to edit it in. I'm just, well, I'll put use you our imagination. <laughs> Uh, you need... Island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, Here's where I would normally turn to Dan and go, help, help. Uh, so problem number one, uh, not enough gear. You need something to be able to do very minute, me minute, 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 <laughs> minute, as we say in France, minute measurements so that you can get the right nut height <laughs> Ooh, wow. or nut relief and so that that, <laughs> that you can measure <laughs> the nut relief <laughs> and iron the burst and berg and dersky. Yeah. Wanna thank Jocelyn at camera two <laughs> <laughs> who, who cannot control her I, I told her to watch Robin, camera three. Robin Williams I'd like to videos. Thank camera before three, we shot. my dear. <laughs> camera four, five, six, seven, eight. So he's got Menudo in his, what is he? He's got, <laughs> he's got, he's got cow stomachs on his at, bench. At the nut sure. height. Yeah. All right, well, I think I get the gist of what he's saying. You want to finish it, or uh, should I just tell you what I can, think he's going to say? Can you recommend yeah. which type yeah. of gauge is best for home setups? Uh, I think which so is the said, opposite. Yeah. And then uh, number two, <clears throat> in electrics, you can adjust saddle height individually. What do you do for acoustics? And kind of what he goes on to say is, you know, my acoustic changes with variations in temperature and humidity. Oh and I can't raise or lower my saddle. Well, mm -hmm. you know, back in mm -hmm. the 50s and 60s, a lot of companies did put mm -hmm. adjustable acoustic right. saddles right. in, but, but ultimately, you're, you're trying to transmit acoustic vibration through two metal bolts, yeah, not which so not, not, so yeah, good. not so good. So, you know, companies like Martin and Taylor and so on, you know, the, the saddle goes into a slot and it rests against, we've shown this diagram a million yeah. times where the saddle drops down and it rests against, and that's, you know, that's where you transmit your vibration. Right. But, what we have for many, many, many years around here recommended to customers, and we frequently do, is... Prozac. It re <laughs> you really don't care anymore about how high your strings are. So that's step one. Oh, that's not what you're going to say. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, if, yeah. if what I was going to suggest is that we make uh, extra seasonal bridge saddles for them. But if we a made Seasonal them, affective disorder, if though. We made them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if we made them out of Prozac, then, right. then when, right. when things are yeah. tough, they just break the, I'll, I'll, break the I'll chew my way out of this dreadnought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you end up with a lampshade around your head. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying, I guess, but I don't know, man. There's, you got to really watch your math when you start mixing it with Luthery. It's more like witchcraft, really. It is, but, yeah. well, I mean, well, I mean the, the two sides of this are, one... Unless you are actually cutting your own nut slots in your guitar and you have a good set of slotting files, you don't need to be measuring nut height. You're, you're either going to let your local repair shop do that for you, or if you have those slots, then you probably already feel advanced enough that you know how deep to cut those slots in the nut for, for the proper string clearance at the first fret. And that is going to, of course, depend on what kind of guitar you have, if it's acoustic or electric, if you're playing heavy metal, if you're playing jazz, you know, your, your clearance at the first fret is going to be different. Well, and, and ultimately, if you measure and each <clears> slot <throat> and say, well, this is how each, high each one has to be, and your neck's bowed like a son of a bitch, 
And then next week you decide, well, now I've realized my neck isn't straight. So then yeah. you straighten your necks. Well, your nut slots are all screwed up. So, I mean, first and foremost, you shouldn't be adjusting your saddle or your nut until you've adjusted your neck. You start with a straight neck and then right. roll with the other things. But, I mean, yeah, you could, I mean, everybody likes their heights differently in, in terms of playability. And every instrument will allow, even if, even if the instruments have the exact same fretwork, which they, of course, can't, you know, they have different resonant properties. You know, certain electrics might resonate like a son of a bitch, and they're just going to buzz. You're going to have to, ra it's just the nature of that instrument, right. you know. And if the fretwork isn't good, you know, all of this work that you're doing at the nut and the saddle is rendered useless because you've got all these weird spots all over your neck. So it, it's, to do it right, you really have to ad address the whole picture, which is the, the neck, the frets, the saddle, the nut. So to just say, well, you should be at one and three quarters, you know, here and... Five sixteenth of a micron over here. I can't tell you that, or you. I don't think one right. can really tell you that because, you know, for example, sometimes I set up Rickenbacker basses, and they sound amazing and they sound great, and there's wonderful recordings of them. And if you listen to a lot of those recordings, you're like, there's kind of this grinding noise and almost <laughs> like a buzzing noise. And I'm like, yeah, you know what that is? That's the string going <laughs> up against the frets because that's what they do. You know, they're just this loud, gangy, you know, nasty son of a gun. You know, and you know, I, you know, you can lower the action super low and play real soft back by the bridge, or you can raise it super high and put wicked bow on the neck and just slam on it with the big fat pick. You know, but that's that's taste. But you know, it's hard to just say there's a textbook way of doing a lot. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people that will write in and say, well, no, you know, this is the way you should look at it. But but again, I, I think, you know, the first thing you should conquer is if you're gonna do this setup business is is get in touch with your neck. Get your neck straight. And get and then I don't know. I mean I guess you really have to look you have to look at the saddle, you have to look at the nut, but Look at the neck and look at the frets first. Well, I, well, I think when, when when we talked, maybe it was in Guitar 101, but we did at some point mention, and, and we'll re, re, reinforce this right now, truss rod adjusting is never used for adjusting action. Yeah. Like you're saying, you, you get your strings on, you tune up to tension, you adjust the truss rod to counterbalance the tension of the strings. That's all the truss rod does. It is never used for adjusting your clearance at the first fret or your, your string height, your, your, your playing action. The truss rod does its one thing, then like you said, once you get your neck in order, then you're dealing with the saddle and the nut, which may, things may need to be lowered, raised, you may have, you know, your action too high down in the first position where you can't play an F bar chord, but you're buzzing like crazy at the 12th fret. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of issues, you know, you need to understand these for a setup, but, yeah, that is, well, is, is a basic yeah. understanding, man. Yeah, and to, then to address your, your saddle electric versus acoustic question directly, um, the thing that we typically do with, with electric saddles is we try to make them follow the radius of the fretboard. And so you can find out what the radius of your fretboard is <coughs> probably from the manufacturer. It'll be 7 or 12, 5 or 10 or whatever it is. Right. And um, Wade has one of these things that you can, you can put um, these little metal tines on, on the fretboard and it, it lays out a little radius and then you can put that on your saddles and kind of make it match up. I don't know if that's a Stu Mac thing or where you got that. But, but more or less, that's what I do is the first thing is I kind of sight the neck and then just take <coughs> those saddles and try to, by eye as best I can, radius them as a starting point to match the fretboard. Right. And with acoustics, you know, you don't typically have that sort of adjustment in height for each individual string. You know, sometimes you, you I do tilting. You know, I might right. tilt the saddle a little bit more on the bass side or whatever. But Yeah, well, and what I was saying, though, about uh, seasonal saddles is, you know, that we frequently, for, for customers, because in Wisconsin uh, it gets so incredibly cold in the winter, Heat is cranked up, guitars get dry. Even if you're using a humidifier, I guarantee the relative humidity inside the body of your acoustic guitar in the middle of January is lower than it is, if you, even if you're using humidifiers, than it is in the middle of July. So your, your top will, will sink a little bit, your action will come down, your guitar is probably going to get a little bit buzzy. So sometimes we will make a winter bridge saddle that will be basically just exactly like the other saddle but maybe you know a sixteenth or an eighth or an eighth inch taller. So all you got to do yep. is add your string change, pop out your summer saddle, pop in your winter saddle, and you're, you're pretty much good to go. That is just a way to keep you going when you when you're playing shows, or you can't get your guitar in for setups because you know if you let it get too dry, or if your neck is a little out of whack, you know you're either going to need to know how to do a little of your own tweaking, or you're going to need to bring it in to somebody like us. 
and the more you keep your guitar regulated, you know, keeping it from bouncing up and down in terms of humidity, which is mainly, okay. you know, it's not a matter of heat, but a matter of humidity, the less you'll have that, you know, ultimately, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. So. All right, we're going to bounce while we're talking about tools. Uh, we had uh, Garrett shoot a little thing for us on uh, his favorite tools. He talked to you last time in Gar uh, two minutes with Garrett about the kind of instruments that he likes. Uh, tonight he's going to talk about uh, his favorite tools. Some of them are things that are easily available online, other things you can probably pick up at woodworking shops. But let's take a look at what Garrett has to say about his favorite tools. Two minutes with Garrett. I'm Garrett, and this is my two minutes. Hi, so what I'd like to talk about today are some, uh, some tools that are, that are good to use for uh, guitar repairs. So, yeah, there. <laughs> so, what, what I have laid out here are, uh, these are all Stu Mac tools, so I'd like to give a shout out to Stuart McDonald. These are some tools that you can get at Stu Mac to further your repair endeavors. These are some files that we got here. These are I, I have all different kinds of files. I use files all the time, and there's so many different kinds for so many different jobs. Um, out of here, uh, this is one that I use all the time for crowning frets and uh, sometimes leveling frets and you know crowning them. And uh, so there's all sorts of rasps, uh, some nut slot files here. I'd still all right. So we got this is a, a magnificent tool that we. Uh, uh, acquired recently for gluing up loose braces. It's a fabulous little jack. Uh, it's got it has magnets here on the ends. Uh, for I use it for storage, for instance. Uh, you can go like this. So uh, use this guy all the time. The fret rocker, checking for high frets. This is a this is a indispensable tool. One of my favorite tools, um, and then last but not least, my Japanese saw. I use this all the time. You can, let's see, you can just. This is about how fast it works. It's, it's this quick. So, shabam. Okay. I cut bone with that too. Let's see. Let's 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 get a piece of bone. We got some bone laying around here. Let's cut. If you don't want to go to the bandsaw. Take out the Japanese saw here. And that's done too. I've sawed a lot of bone with this thing. I don't know, that's my uh, life. Uh, and I'm wrapping it up. Thank you so much, get it? Uh, Garrett does have some awesome tools. As a matter of fact, when he came into the shop a little over a year ago, I was pretty impressed at the level of tool selection because when I was 24 and, and wet behind the ears and learning uh, to be a guitar repairman, I, that's sweat now. Okay. Because <laughs> it's in hot lights. It's but hot uh, lights. but yeah. the, there were not really cool tools available like that because there was no Stuart McDonald, there were no Luthier supply shops. So I mean, uh, my, my I was doing most of the stuff uh, repair wise at a little shop in San Francisco uh, called Jacobs and Son Fine Guitars. And I used to go and buy my tools at uh, a hardware store in Pacific Heights and kind of mod them to be guitar repair tools. And, and Garrett does have a bunch of stuff like that too, where he just totally. buys hardware store, you know, rasps and stuff like that and modifies them for his needs. But Stuart, McD uh, Stuart McDonald, stumac.com, has been a great resource for a lot of the tools that we use around the shop here. So like the mirrors that he showed and uh, the little scissor clamp and stuff like that, you know. Cool just, stuff that is really guitar specific. Oh my god, yeah, and it yeah. has just saved us so much time and frustration around here. So so check it out, stumac.com, really great stuff. I also quickly wanted to mention, I forgot to mention when we were talking about the flood, that uh, our butts really got helped and saved around here 
by Service Master, which, you know, I, I just need to give these guys a shout out because these guys were amazing. I mean, this is what they specialize in coming in after floods and fires and helping people, you know, get their, their homes and businesses back in shape. And they came in and did an unbelievable job of helping us out. And the, the, the guy who kind of ran the show around here was a guy named Don Lloyd, who Thanks, just, <laughs> yes, he was just absolutely amazing. And he's a guitar player and, and knows what we were up against with just the, the water situation and the humidity situation and uh, providing us the equipment that we needed right away to make sure that our instruments were not permanently damaged. You know, So we, we did not get flooding on the main floor here, but because of the extreme high humidity of everything, you know, the floor in the basement having been soaked, we, <coughs> we had to very quickly control that humidity. So, so Don was able to get equipment in here mucho pronto and help us get the humidity right down to where it needed to be and we had no guitar problems upstairs on the main floor so all the Martin acoustics and all the Alvarez's and Rickenbackers and whatnot all survived unscathed so Service Master and Don thank, thank you, you so much. much. Also if I could just say quickly yeah. we, we had a we didn't it was so crazy we uh, we didn't even check the messages on the voicemail and oh, maybe right. four or five days after I don't know if it was the first flood or the second flood I started checking the the answer machine and it was one customer after another going hey guys I heard about the flood give me a call back I'll come down there me and my buddies will help you out and blah, yes. blah 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 and so there were I don't want to name one after the other but there was just tons of customers that called and offered to help and stuff and so you know who you are and we appreciated that as well so yes oh and and we did have help on one we did day, as yes, well that, as well um, was uh, uh, Joe, Joe uh, yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> Joe's last name I feel bad oh so no oh, yeah We'll, we'll get it in post, but anyway, Joe, it, you, thanks it, again. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the Coca-Cola that's uh, the fizz in our head right now. Yes. They're making the <laughs> but it, yeah. it was a huge help, and to everybody who did offer their help, and, huh? Joe Otto, right, of course. Joe Otto, oh, jeez, yeah. Yes. Anyway, Joe Otto was, Otto was, Otto, Joe, was yeah. in the trenches with us, uh, knee-deep yes. in the sludge. So, Joe, you know who you are, and we appreciate that uh, so much. Yes, so, here's, yeah. here's Joe right here. Yeah. I, I was like, no, we're Joe. good. He's like, no, nah, I better help you guys out. And we were like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, he brought dehumidifiers and stuff. Too. Yeah, so he, he did was, as well. He, so he, he was, was, he was a lifesaver too. We had uh, some guardian angels for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so the last quick thing I want to talk about is uh, I can't tell you how many times people have brought in guitars that they bought on eBay. Yes. eBay. And were not quite what they expected. So <laughs> I just wanted to quick shoot with you questions that you know if you're if you're bidding on something on eBay you you have the right to send questions to the seller do it send them questions get the questions answered of what you need to know to make sure you're getting a good deal so if you're looking at something on eBay you're looking at an acoustic guitar and it says 60s Martin good condition sounds good I don't know much about acoustic guitars but this one belonged to my uncle, something like that. You can tell it's not from a, a musical instrument seller. Right. You're interested in buying it. You know, what's a couple questions that you're going to shoot to somebody on eBay to help prevent you from getting a guitar that's got, you know, cracked braces or you know, bad honestly, frets or something? Honestly, that's an area you described to me. <clears throat> I'd buy a $300 Yamaha from that guy. But I wouldn't buy a, a 60s Martin from it. Right. If you want to buy a 60s Martin, buy it at least from, you know, one of these companies that deals in, you know, because, I mean... Somebody who's got the incredibly detailed description. Right, of the at least Martin. that. Right. I mean, at least somebody who goes, this is, a, you know, a 63, you know, D28 Brazilian Rosewood Quarter Son, you know. Right. I mean, at <clears> least knows what the hell it is, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, if there's detailed pictures there, you know... I mean, sometimes there's the pictures of the D28s next to the couch eight feet away, and that's the only picture you get. Right, right. Beware, you know. If there's detailed pictures of the frets and the fretboard up close, I mean, if you're going to buy a 1000 to two, $3,000 guitar, you want to see detailed pictures, definitely. Um, I guess, to me, if I was going to buy a sort of a more high-end guitar like that, I think I would almost, you know, I would almost look at, Especially, I guess, if it was something really hard to find and rare and you really wanted it and it, right. and it was a situation like that, I guess I would just say, hey, you know, I'll pay shipping back if if you'll give me a couple days with this instrument so I can bring it over to my local luthier and just have them check it out. 
Well, I mean, you know, it, or, it's, it's eBay. You, yeah. I, I don't think you're going to get that on eBay. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's part of the gamble. I think everybody really gets caught up in the excitement of, well, they're going to get it at a pretty good deal. Right. So that way, you know, if, if it's got a buzzy fret or something, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Right. But when guitars come in here for sale, you know, we have sort of a checklist. You know, it's, it's a mental checklist, but it absolutely has to be done. And the, and right. the things that we look for are... I mean, the obvious things. We look for cracks. We, we stick a mirror inside of acoustic guitars. We look for, for loose or cracked or repaired braces. Mm -hmm. You look for fret wear, particularly on the first five frets, where mm -hmm. most people are playing the cowboy chords. That's where you get the most heavy fret wear. Because if you have big divots in the frets on one, two, three, you're going to be needing a fret leveling, and that's going to be 100 bucks for most of you. Uh, we look for... Uh, Satellite. Saddle hype on, on acoustics us, yeah. or or on electric guitars, you know that uh, that the bridge is actually functional, adjustable. Right? right. Can you know. can you raise the bridge up and down on electric and on an acoustic if the neck has slowly come forward, not just from bow to nut, but but the whole neck angle as it comes forward, you're lowering and lowering that saddle. So if you're looking at the '60s D28 and the saddle is barely poking up above the bridge, you can almost guarantee that you need a neck reset. Or the next bowed so much that the saddles come all the way down, right. in which case either scenario is bad because I'd almost take the neck reset over the extremely bowed neck because there's no truss rod in this guitar we're talking right. about. Um, so that's the kind of thing you want to know too. If you're going to buy a 60s Martin, realize you don't have a truss rod. You know, realize that it's 40 years, 50 years old. and Or, or, you know, or whatever the guitar is. Though. I mean, yeah. like if, if a guitar has a truss rod, I mean, we would never, ever buy a guitar if we did not test the truss Make rod sure first. Make sure it functions. You know, if, if you trust the person who who's selling it, if, if their descriptions are detailed enough or if they list themselves as a business, ask us questions. How's the truss rod? How's the, the fret wear on the first five frets? You know, how is the action at the 12th fret? You know, ask the kind of things that are going to save you from very expensive repairs. And, and, and also maybe, you know, factor in a setup. You know, when you get an instrument through the mail, well, I would do funny that things anyway. can happen. Yeah. You know, make sure you get a setup. Uh, Will Ray uh, writes articles. He's in the Hellcasters. He writes articles for um, guitar players sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I was, he was, did a, a similar kind of thing, you know, where he was saying, you know, buying stuff on eBay, you know. But one of the things he said was, well, I buy a lot of stuff that I can factor in worst case scenario. So he's like, well, I bought this Epiphone for like 200 bucks with a cracked headstock. Right. You know, which I, even that, the cracked headstock thing would just be, uh, I don't know, you know. Yeah. But he's like, <clears throat> you know, I had my buddy <clears throat> fix it up for me a little bit, and I got a $200 casino, okay. you know, or whatever. So, you know, sometimes if you just factor in sort of worst case scenarios, right. then sure, you know, I wouldn't pass on on something pretty cool yeah. if it was priced. But, you know, you've said this to me before too, you know, if it's if it sounds too good to be true, maybe it is, yeah. you know. So right. you gotta you gotta watch that kind of stuff too. You know? There's your lesson for life, everybody, as we roll out of the Guitar Shop Podcast Season Two, episode <laughs> Episode four. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So <laughs> yeah. check out the Guitar Shop Podcast on the iTunes store, Zoom Marketplace, Miro, and of course at wadesguitarshop.com. That's our home. Click on the podcast link. Questions, comments, please send them along. We'd love to get them. We respond to most of them. I think we've actually responded to everyone, but not necessarily on the show. So you will get a response in email and possibly the on the show. guitar-related ones. Though there's a lot of others that I yeah, privately that, respond to. <laughs> 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 Wade's Guitar Shop at SBC Global. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. It's a whole different thing altogether. We've missed you. We've missed you over here. He's Jocelyn. bleeding. Oh, no, he lost an eye. We'll be back again very soon. Yeah, I like the camera shaking. Ooh, and the guitar is creaking. <laughs> and she's still laughing from before. Laughing uncontrollably. Uh, hopefully Dan will be with us sometime very soon. Uh, the holiday's coming up. He's got a little one at home. This is a shout out to Dan. Good job. <laughs> yeah, go. Oh, you Okay, but is that... Thank you. <laughs> it would be equally... Like if there they're was a not, picture of some hunting dogs yeah, they're and not, setters or something exactly, on there they're too. They're not quite right. There's something just not right about it all.
<laughs> what is it? Oh, very wrong. Somehow. It's like, wait a minute, this guitar has four pickups. Here. 